Well, good evening, friends. Welcome to Hannibal LaGrange University. My name is Dr. Eric Turner. I'm the chair of the Arts and Humanities Division tonight, and uh, it's a, a, pr a privilege to introduce to you our, our speaker. Born in a, a punishing society devoted to the worship of Kim Jong-il, North Korean defector, human rights activist, and TED speaker, Yunmi Park, is a leading voice of oppressed people around the world. At the age of 13, she and her family made a daring escape to China in search of a life free of tyranny. She recounts this incredible story in her searing memoir, In Order to Live, A North Korean Girl's Journey to Freedom, which Kirkus called, quote, an eloquently, wrenchingly honest work that vividly represents the plight of many North Koreans. Named one of BBC's top 100 global women, Park delivers passionate and deeply personal speeches that have garnered nearly 350 million online views. Would you please join me in giving a large Hannibal LaGrange University welcome to Yunmi Park. Oh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Um, it's an honor, and it's really surreal to be standing here today. I often get very, very nervous before speech, <laughs> and there's one thing that always calms me down, is the thought that I remind myself, even if I go up there and screw up, at the end of the day, I'm not going to be executed. <laughs> so... What do I have to lose, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I got to be the first North Korean ever stepped on Hannibal, Missouri. <laughs> Don't you think so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you for welcoming to your beautiful town and this university. When I was born in North Korea, I could never have dreamed of this, even going to a university. Now I'm here in the university as a speaker. When I was born in my home country, my, I was born in a family where my great-grandfather was a landowner. Therefore, the regime did decide that my blood was tainted. They decided that my genetics was oppressive because of my ancestors' crime. When North Koreans born into the country, we are divided into three different classes, different castes. And it's an easier way to understand this way, in a, almost like in a fruit category. First class, first, first caste is tomato. You're red inside, you're red outside. Therefore, you're a complete communist. There's no doubt about how committed you are to the ideology. Second, the middle class, they call it apple. You're red outside, but inside is white, so you're questionable. Therefore, you need government surveillance. Last class is a grape. You're so screwed. You're not red inside, you're not red outside. Therefore, you are a hostile class. Within these three classes, the regime divided North Koreans into 51 classes within that caste system. And you know what North Korea began as a nation that was committed to achieve a perfect equality of outcomes. They wanted equality in everything. They called us a socialist paradise. We ended up with 51 different classes right now. Does that remind you of anything? I have a son. I came to America in 2014. And actually, I became American last year. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's life a miracle because when I was growing up in North Korea, Americans were my sworn enemy. In school, I still remember learning math for the first time in my textbook. In my textbook, my math question was like this. There are four American bastards. You kill two of them. How many American bastards left to kill? <laughs> 
That was my math question. I am now I'm a you know one of pastor myself. <laughs> and I have a son who is a beautiful, who is five years old. He's half white, half North Korean. And I thought that was the best thing I ever did for him, was giving him the freedom that born in the country of this beautiful land. However, America, unfortunately, I see something so familiar every day living here. I see North Korea. I see this country becoming like North Korea every single day. They tell my son that he is privileged, something called the white privilege. And they say he's guilty, he should be guilty for what his ancestors did. If he becomes a successful, American society gonna tell him, oh, you're successful because of your privilege. Nobody gonna ever have a sympathy for his hard work, his decency, and his integrity. He's also punished for his ancestors' crime, like North Korea, that we are divided based on what our ancestors did. Growing up in North Korea, the very first thing my mother told me as a young girl was, don't even whisper, because the birds and mice couldn't hear me. The most dangerous thing that I had in my body was my tongue. If I said one thing wrong in North Korea, it was not just going to execute me, it was going to execute up to eight generations of your family. I grew up in North Korea surviving eating a lot of plants and insects. I'm on a high hill right now, five inch hill, and despite that, I'm very short. North Koreans are, on average, five inch shorter than South Koreans because of the malnutrition. We don't even have electricity in the 21st century. And I, I, I live in New York City. I have a lot of friends who are so passionate about climate change. I tell them, why don't you go to North Korea? Because we have Earth Day every day. <laughs> we have zero impact, zero impact in the climate. We have no, no pollution whatsoever. And we have insects. We do not butcher cows there. It's a perfect paradise right now for the climate change activists in America. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I remember eating grasshoppers. It was of delicacy, dragonflies. And my friend, who was uh, the boys, would catch cockroaches. And when you split a cockroach, there looks like a little thing looks like brown rice in it. And they eat that and keep asking me, eat it, it's so delicious. That's how North Koreans live. And I remember growing up in North Korea, looking on the street, like seeing dead bodies. It's like looking at a tree. When you die from starvation, you go through three stages of death. The first stage is, you know that you're dying from starvation and you beg for food. Second stage is you completely lost. You've gone insane. You laugh. You don't know your children. You don't know who you are. And the last stage of death from starvation is where entire hole in your body opens up. Your organs come out of you. And looking at that, as a child, I didn't feel anything. Not because I was a psychopath, because the regime did not teach me the word sympathy. In North Korea, there is no word for love. There is no word for human rights. There is no word for liberty. Dictator removed the word in our dictionary because, you know what? If you don't know the word, that means you don't know the concept. That's how they control your thinking, your thoughts. This concerns me greatly living in America right now. The Americans' obsession on language with the current political correctness, what we can say, 
what we cannot say. This language control, that's the ultimate goal. They want to control what you can think. So growing up in North Korea, I had no idea what my sympathy was, what compassion was. By that time, when I was 13 years old, we couldn't just simply find animal food. So we decided to escape. My sister escaped first, and I wanted to go escape with her to China, but I couldn't because I got very sick in my stomach. My mom took me to a hospital to get examined. And again, this is a socialist paradise. We have free education, free health care. In the free healthcare hospital, the nurse uses one needle to inject every patient. Doctors opened me up without any painkiller that afternoon. And they tied me, and they thought I had appendicitis, but when they opened up, I just had a malnutrition infection. They got embarrassed, so they still removed my appendix. So I'm gonna sue him when I go back to North Korea. <laughs> So my appendix is missing from me. After closing up, I crossed the river in 2007 in March, March 26th, when I was 13 years old. Um, as soon as we crossed that frozen river in China, the very first thing that I saw was my mother was being raped. And then Chinese people told us that because of uh, Chinese regime does not recognize us as refugees, they said that we had to be sold as sex slaves. And there are three places where North Korean women end up. Number one place that North Korean women end up in China when they escape is organ harvesting. They buy us, they take our organs out, and they discard our body like pigs. Second place they buy North Koreans are the brothers. In the brothers, they don't even have a window. They prog her and they drug her and rape her up to 500 times a day. And then usually they don't last more than six months and die and then they replace a girl. The third place that my mother I ended up was just a sex slavery. It's something sold to a fake husband. Do you guys all remember one child policy that China had? What an idiotic idea a government thought somehow is a good idea for let people have only one child. Because of that idiotic policy, more Chinese people aborting girls and keeping boys. Now they have a lack of women to marry this man. There are 33 million men in China right now cannot find wives. So they buy North Korean girls. They bought my mother for $65 in 21st century. And they sold me for just about of above $200 because I was 13 and child virgin. Uh, two years living as a sex slave, I saw a miracle. After two years, I met a missionary from South Korea. And then this missionary said there was a way of going somewhere to be free. And as I said, as a North Korean, I did not know the word free. So I asked the person, what do you mean that I'm going to be free in South Korea? And this person said, I know, like, how would you describe freedom to a North Korean, right? They did a perfect job. This lady said, because I was like 15 years old teenage girl, she said, if you go to South Korea, you can watch K-dramas, because I love the K-dramas. And then sweetie, you can wear pants, like jeans. In North Korea, you go to prison camp if you wear jeans, because jeans were made in America. They say it's a symbol of greedy capitalism. And they execute people for reading a Bible, they execute people before watching a wrong movie. So I thought, really there's a place where humans can go and choose their own pants and watch their own TV? I said, I'm going to risk my life for that again. So at 15, 
I chose to be free. And this time was walking across frozen Gobi Desert into Mongolia from China in minus 40 degrees. And somehow, we do, I don't know what, what was about me so lucky, I made it. Do you know how many North Koreans made it to America over the last 80 years? 209 of us made it to America over the li last 80 years. So I made it to Mongolia, and then from there, they helped me to go to South Korea. I went to South Korea, and then I learned that Americans were not bastards, <laughs> they were not monsters, and they said Americans are lovely people. And for the first time in South Korea, I learned that it was so painful, it was so difficult to be free. I, I said at some point in South Korea, if they gave me enough fruit and not executing me, I would go back to North Korea. Because I never thought for myself. Like in South Korea, suddenly, they were keep asking me, what do you want to do with your life? And I was like, do I have to know? <laughs> Can't you just not tell me what to do? Because in North Korea, they tell you what to do. They tell you what to wear, what to listen to, how to walk, who you marry, what to do, where do you live in. Everything is decided by the government. And suddenly, in South Korea, I was free. And freedom was responsibility. I was so scared of it. And then I remember they said, asking me, like, why don't you introduce yourself? It's not that hard. Why don't you say your name and your favorite color? And then in, in North Korea, we don't have the word I. We only have the word we. So I was keep saying we, and then my teacher was saying, no, you say I. And like, just tell us what's your favorite color. I did not know because the regime told me that my favorite color was red because it was a revolutionary color. Five years of in South Korea, I came to America to study at Columbia University in New York City. And I thought that was the journey to freedom. This is my journey ends to look for freedom. I, I, I'm going to a promised land, right? This is the best country in human history. And now I come to Colombia. The very first day, I was shocked. The things that professors were teaching at Columbia University were exact same things that my North Korean teachers taught me in North Korean classroom. In some sense, even North Korea was not that crazy compared to Colombia. And that's how you know how far America gone. At Columbia University, my professors were saying that all the problems that we have in the world right now is because of greedy capitalism and the white men. And they said the only solution for all these problems is a communist revolution. And then we have to tear down the constitution and rebuild this country in the name of equity, equality of outcomes, collectivism. And I asked professors like, what are you talking about? I was trying to question them, and they said, I'm brainwashed, and they will shut me off. And it is so unfortunate to say, standing here today as an American, and as a mother myself, America is becoming a mockery of the world because of our wokeness. Wokeism is exported to other nations. And in the 21st century, with the alignment, the idea of alignment was there to think. The nation that discovered all these amazing ideas does not know what woman is. How far did it go back? It's not even just five centuries, even not in the dark ages. This is the end of civilization. And this is where, why I'm standing here. When I was escaping from North Korea, I had a hope, because I had a 
place to escape to, to America. If America falls, what's your plan? Where are you going? Are you going to the moon? To the Mars with Elon Musk? This is all we got. Before I realized how bad things got in America, I used to think that I used to ask people to care about North Korean human rights issue. And people would ask me, like, hey, why do I have to care about human rights for North Korean people? And I was thinking, because the humans, we are the only ones can fight for human rights. Do you think that puppies are going to fight for human rights? You think the dolphins are going to do that? We are the only ones can fight for human rights. That's why we have to fight for human rights. And I was always thinking, because when I was in North Korea, the problem was that nobody was free that was left who could have a voice, who could fight for freedom. Imagine on the day when none of us are free. Who's going to fight for us? Nobody can and nobody will. And that's why still, as a free people that we are sitting here today, it is our duty to defend America, defend freedom, and defend our rights. Because even America is a, it's not immune to tyranny. We all saw that last three years during the pandemic, how much power government could gain and how much control they could have over individuals. The fact that I fell in love with, fell in love with America is not because America is big and wealthy and beautiful. It was because of this idea, a nation dedicated to protect individual liberty because individuals are the smallest minority. That's why America is great, and that's what made America wonderful. And that is going away. So thank you for coming out from your home today and coming here to hear my story. We are going to open up this stage for more Q&As. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Okay. okay, we're going to open this up for a time of question and answer, uh, but our procedures are going to be, uh, because we have a full room, if you're going to have a question, we just ask you to come to the aisle, and we're going to have some ambassador and ambassadors that will uh, meet you with a microphone. I'm, I'm going to lead us off, uh, you on me, with a question. So, um, as, as we are a Christian university, what, what advice would you have for our, our community and our students uh, as we think about human rights, as we think about activism, what advice would you have for our uh, college students? Uh, I always believe that the purpose of edu education is seeking truth. And it's like North Korea now in America, it's hard to find truth because there is a force in America, like North Korea, that is going after truth and hiding truth. And it's harder and harder to find it. So I think it'd be a very important thing for us to always seeking that North Star and looking for truth and standing up for truth. Thank you. Now questions from the, from the crowd. So come to the aisle. We have students that will come to you. Hi, my name is Robert Vandelict. I'm glad you're able to come here and speak to us. Um, I have a question. In South Korea, there's agencies that help the North Korean defectors, but lately there's been articles about some North Korean defectors ending up committing suicide because they don't, they're not getting the support they really should. Do you think that there's anything different that people could do to help the North Korean defectors to get the support that they need to become more integrated? Uh, I think you your personality helped you a lot, but is there anything else that could be done? Yeah, thank you so much for the question. I know it's like 
going through all that journey and North Koreans do make it to South Korea and uh, in South Korea they are the highest group that commits suicide it's it's not because of the lack of support it's because lack of acceptance from people and this is where I get so angry when people are questioning the tolerance of American society my story is only possible because America it's America is that great South Korea is a same we have the same genetics we are the brothers and cousins but when we go to South Korea they discriminate us heavily and because we have a northern accent we cannot get a job as a waitress in the restaurant and I go to a market with my mother who's in South Korea and to buy clothes with her and she, when she asked how much she's in northern accent they ask her to leave they don't want to sell the clothes to my mom and because of discrimination I think a lot of South Koreans are having a hard time and my hope is if America were willing to open to North Korean immigration, but they are not, believe it or not, North America do not, do not want North Koreans to come here. And that's why they are so literal of us here. And you know, it's, it's not even many of us escaping, but despite that little number, somehow America just does not open up their doors to us. And that would be great if more of us can come here and you know, join this amazing society. <laughs> okay, we have a question here, and then one up above, and then we'll come back here. So I was just wondering if you could tell us what happens with the elderly in North Korea. Uh, my grandmother, when I was born, all my pa grandparents passed away because North Koreans live not don't live that long, and my grandmother. 58, she passed away from starvation. And I remember people saying, oh, she lived a long time. You, you, you shouldn't be that sad. And my father passed away at 46. And people also said, oh, he had a, he had a long run. And that's why in North Korea, you don't die from cancer. Nobody ever lived that long enough to get a cancer and die. This usually other things catch you and most of North Koreans have TB, tuberculosis, and then, so yeah, there's no elder care, there's no minor care, there's no concept of minor. They, even you're five years old, we have to be mobilized and forced labor for the government. So there's no concept of, you know, the people that need the protection, just everybody's a revolutionary, everybody just works death and nobody live, can, can live that long. There's a question at the top there. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. That was very interesting when you said that there were some words that they did not have in North Korea. Were there any other new ideas for which there were no words in North Korea that you learned when you got out? Oh, uh, I learned the word critical thinking. <laughs> because critical thinking, because in North Korea we don't know what critical thinking is. That's not a thing. And this is a, where it comes to a lot of people when I meet. The first question they ask me is, you seem normal. You don't look very retarded. <laughs> they don't say, but that's a look. But like, so why there is no revolution in North Korea? And like, are, are you guys all dumb? Are you so brainwashed that you don't just rise up? The, the degree of oppression that North Korean regime achieved is that they oppress us so much that we don't know that we are oppressed. And when I was at Columbia University, my classmates will keep telling me they're oppressed. They're so oppressed. I was like asking them, how are you oppressed? And these kids are in, you know, their Lululemon yoga pants on their like green juice detox. Everybody choose to be vegan by choice. And vegan food is more expensive than, you know, chicken nuggets actually. 
So it's only fans people luxury. It's like luxury belief that you can only afford when you are top elite in living in New York City. And they saying they are oppressed because the society does not recognize their pronouns. And they have 10,000 different pronouns. They feel differently every second. They feel like pansexual, like the other minute they feel like they, the other minute they feel like Z or anything, it changes. And somehow we cannot catch up with that. They say they're oppressed. But when it comes to actual oppressed people, you don't know even you're oppressed. So if you don't know you're a slave, how do you fight to be free? And that's a problem in North Korea. The people don't know what life could be like. They don't know life could be like this. Hi, Yanmi. Um, I, uh, I have a little bit of a more personal question for you. So um, my name is Kaylin. I'm, I'm good friends with uh, Cherry and Irene Yang, um, who are also defectors from North Korea who live here in America. I know that you know them. And I've been discussing with her recently, and she's been giving me her input. Um, what can I personally um, do to pursue uh, human rights activism as a career um, specifically geared towards, uh, you know, freedom and uh, assisting North Korean people and the East. I, I've been learning um, Japanese and, and uh, Korean for a few years now, and I, it's my dream to work with you or with, uh, you know, Link or Crossing Borders or one of those organizations but I don't know what to pursue at, at a collegiate level or, or otherwise, so I wondered if you had any advice for me um, to, to join you and, and work. Yeah, thank you for your heart for North Korean people. Very first advice is that what to avoid. It's, you know, do not join UN. <laughs> in my experience, that has been the most worthless, useless organization in my life. So when people say they want to change the world, <laughs> thank you so much. So yeah, just as long as you avoid the UN and the options outside of UN would be, there are actually very effective Christian groups that still working underground in China that rescues North Koreans. And they are the most reliable rescue route still for North Korean people. Because um, so joining them, they need an English translator or like volunteering work or a full-time job. Or those NGOs can make a lot of difference. Otherwise, the advocacy work in America that people don't realize in America somehow North Korea exists as its own. The regime only exists because of China sponsors it. The accountability lays in Chinese hand, not even Kim Jong-un at this point, and Trump got that right. All the keys in the hands of Xi Jinping. So that awareness is lacking in the West, and I've been trying, struggling with this message. I've been trying to go talk to big Jeff Bezos, talk to Nancy Pelosi, Hillary Clinton. These people on the outside say they care about, they say slavery is wrong. They stand with justice. And I told them I was a slave. There are 300,000 North Korean young girls as sex slaves in China. I asked them, can you do something about it? They said, don't even tell people that you know me. And there's a producer in Hollywood who wants to make a movie about my story. And the script came, I read the script last year. And the script says, China was my promised land. China gave me refuge and protection. I called the producer, like, what are you talking about? This is like pure lie. And he said, this is the only way we can make a movie about North Korea in Hollywood. So we need that uh, raising awareness in America, the, the evil, the darkness of Chinese regime. And if we convince China, we definitely can free North Korean people. So yeah, I hope we can work together someday. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, hi. Um, thank you very much, by the way. Your story was very moving. Um, I'm kind of a history buff, so my question is, um, before Kim Il-sung took power, um, North Korea was ruled by Imperial Japan. Um, before then, what did they teach you in the, um, I guess it'd be the public education system, like before the um, Kim dynasty took power? So right before Kim was a 30 years of uh, colonization by Japan. And before, it was a feudal system where 
they had their caste system and they had slavery. This is so hilarious to American people. They say only white men enslaved other people. I'm like, are you kidding me? Have you studied any history? We had a slavery entire our existence in Korea. <laughs> they slaved, enslaved each other. So <laughs> there's a slavery class, a little bit trading, like market class, and the elite. The ones that were scholars and the, like samurais that were like soldiers. And each era, the samurai takes over, the military takes over, the next era, the you know, intelligence takes over, and most majority people were enslaved and they were forced to work for this few elite on the top. So most of Korean history, really very, very dark and oppressive state. And South Korea, when they copied the American government system with checks and balances and free democracy and free market, South Korea became the 10th largest economy in the world. They finally saw the light when I discovered the Western civilization, the ideas of this country, and the North Korea still in the darkness. Thank you. Yes, uh, what was your reaction when Donald Trump, Trump met with the little rocket man over there in North Korea? So I mean, uh, when Kim, Trump met Kim Jong-un? Yeah. yeah. Oh, this is a thing. <laughs> I love, so when Trump was Kim, meeting Kim Jong-un and I was criticizing it and that was the only time the New York Times wanted to put me on their front page. <laughs> and the BBC and the Time Magazine, so when they said like, she was featured by New York Times and Washington, like, all of Washington Post, like yeah, because I was criticizing Trump. <laughs> so, now, after time goes back, you know, I gained more perspective, but Trump is a businessman. He's not a politician. And I think he had this very optimism where if he almost like, you know, deceived Kim Jong-un in a way that America not gonna attack and giving him the, all the support he needs, denuclearize the country, then he can get the deal. But Kim Jong-un is a pure evil. You know, Kim Jong-un was educated in Switzerland with his sister and his childhood. He knows what democracy is. He knows what human rights is. And he went back to North Korea, did the exact opposite. When some people don't know and then commit it, at some sense you understand it. But this guy is a pure, cold-blooded, like, evil. Therefore, there's no way Kim Jong-un was going to give up the news and help the people. And he was just trying to buy time with Trump because Trump was tough, that he was scared of Trump. If North Korea did another missile conduct, missile test, Trump was saying, you know, Kim Jong-un, my nuclear button is bigger than yours. Do you remember the letter that he sent? North Korea was not there to test missile. So he was trying to buy the time, and now Biden is in the office. Biden calls North Korea. Kim Jong-un does not even call him back. American president cannot hear back from North Korean dictator. We became a joke. But I think I understood his intention, but I just knew at the time that there's no way that Kim Jong-un was that naive. And so that was very complex. But one good thing that Trump did a lot with North Korean people is that he raised awareness that China was a problem, that Xi Jinping was a problem, that when it comes to policy, that we make in America that we need to talk to China first. So, yeah, <laughs> that's my analysis of Trump afterwards. Thank you. Okay, we have time for one more question. Um, welcome to Missouri. Thank you, Thank you for, for being here. <clears throat> um, you mentioned about um, the movie deal. Do you believe that China is behind the cultural Marxism that we see across our country. Thank you. Uh, I love you guys so much. This time is already up. <laughs> so if China is behind all this woke ideology that tearing our country apart, I do know that they give so much money. The funding comes from China in Hollywood. So many politicians in bed with Chinese money. Invest, investment banking, hedge funds, universities, they gave funding from China. And they you know, now study Confuci Confu Confucianism centers that are starting in the Ivy League schools. But 
we cannot really blame this on China or anybody else because if we don't destroy ourselves, nobody can destroy us. The suicide that is happening is committed by us, by Americans. No amount of force, no amount of money can do that if Americans truly believe in freedom and the value of human rights. The real problem is that this modernity, that as we move forward from God and church, that we lost morality and the virtue and, and the discipline, and we, we forgot what it means to be free. And I think that's why all these things coming and we just get confused and everybody feels differently and they think there's like 10,000 different genders. So at the end of the day, I don't think China is the main thing. It just somehow internally, we, are, we became so weak, we became so hollow and we are filling up with the trash and garbage that is rotting us all together. Thank you. So okay, at, at this time, I'd like to bring up. So much. Thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank at this time, I'd like to bring up President Dr. Matz, uh, just for a few closing words as we, as we dismiss. Well, if you are grateful for Ms. Park and her story, Ms. Park will be in the lobby here in just a minute, and she'll have a few minutes to visit with a few of you as, as that is there. As we come to a close, I first want to say a word of thanks to the Mormon Society, M-O-O-R-M-A-N, Society, and the grant they provide through the Foundations for a Free Society that we have here at Hannibal LaGrange. We have a couple representatives of them here to this evening who've made that possible. Would you give them a, a round of applause as well? As Ms. Park has shared, freedom is free, but it does not come cheap. And at Hannibal LaGrange University, we are committed to building a free society. Towards, I'll, I'll take a round of applause for that, absolutely. Towards that very end, we have a, a, a program here that all our students are exposed to in various ways, shapes, or forms through our Free Society grant that promotes the principles of a democratic government, free market economics, and strong cultural institutions like the local church. Every student here is educated in these. Towards that end, we want to make those free society principles accessible to as many students as possible. Towards that end, we give away over $4 million in scholarships to our students every year so that they learn what it takes to build and protect a free society. If you want to be part of that, we have some information out in the lobby. You see a QR code here on the screen. We invite you to give to HLG to help support those scholarships that teach students about these foundations and help them learn what it is to protect freedom. Ms. Park, we thank you for being here with us. You're welcome to visit with her in the lobby. You can find out some more information on Hannibal LaGrange out there in the lobby as well. Thank you for coming out tonight. God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you at our next Free Society event. Good evening. <laughs>